the early Christians expected suffering. It was part and parcel of their obedience to Jesus Christ. When they received Jesus Christ, they knew the cost that came with it. And they were very much willing and ready to suffer for their faith. For instance, the Apostle Paul commends the young Thessalonian believers on the way they receive the gospel message. He tells them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, In spite of severe suffering, you welcome the message with great joy given by the Holy Spirit. Now, compare that mindset with our own mindset, the mindset of our modern generation of believers. Quite the opposite, right? Many modern believers are averse to suffering. In fact, some think that God should rescue them from every minor difficulty or discomfort that they experience. They have this notion that God should shield them from all kinds of opposition and persecution, from injustices, abuses, and they seem to respond negatively toward God when He refuses to deliver them. Many modern Christians are only willing to obey if they could do it quite comfortably and with great ease. I do believe that we ought to call modern-day believers again to possess the biblical mindset that early Christians had. We need to be reminded of what the Master says in Scripture. For instance, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 9, He tells His disciples, You will be hated by all nations because of Me. And also in John chapter 15, verse 20, He says here, Remember the words I have spoken to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Now these words are not only for disciples then, but they are for modern day disciples as well. Not only do we see this from the Gospels, from the very words of Jesus Christ, but we see this all throughout the New Testament. We read, for instance, in the book of James, James chapter 1, verses 2 to 3. James says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. He urges Christians to welcome, welcome persecution, welcome difficulties that come as a result of our obedience to Jesus Christ. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 13, Peter says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, uh, there lies the idea of welcoming, welcoming the, the suffering that comes from our obedience to Jesus Christ. It should not come as a surprise. But rather, the Apostle Peter says, Rejoice! Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. In our text, Peter goes through the accomplishments of Jesus Christ, His death and also His resurrection. Peter tells us what Christ's suffering and death have beautifully produced in our lives as believers. Jesus Christ is set here as the supreme example of someone who suffered for doing what is right. Now, I don't want us to miss out on the purpose of Peter's insertion. He inserts this portion of Scripture in order to make us realize that when God allows us to go through suffering, 
it is always for a purpose. And knowing this helps us to endure the suffering and not try to escape it. Let me go through the vicarious suffering of Jesus Christ as seen in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Peter says this, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. Now the first thing we learn about the suffering of Jesus Christ was that this was the very plan of God. His cruel suffering and death was the very plan of God. If there was a man who suffered unjustly, it was Jesus Christ. He even died the most cruel death ever, death on the cross, the crucifixion. And add to that, his death was an unjust death. Let me note down three things about Christ's unjust suffering. First, he died not because of any unrighteousness he had done. The Bible clearly emphasizes that point that Jesus was innocent of all accusations. In other words, he died sinless. That is emphasized in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. The Apostle Paul writes, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Second item. Second thing that we learn about Christ's suffering is that Christ died not for himself, but for others, for our sins. That's why this is called as vicarious, the just for the unjust. You see, it was our sins that brought about Christ's death. His death was God's judgment on sin. We read that in a prophecy found in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 to 6. Let me read that. Verse 4, Surely He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered Him stricken by God, smitten by Him, and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Verse 6, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The third thing, the third lesson we learn about the suffering of Christ is that Christ died as part of God's plan to save the world. Now, how many of us would agree that it was God's will for Christ, it was God's will for His only begotten Son to suffer and die? How many of us would agree that the procedure of his suffering, the circumstances surrounding the death of Jesus Christ, are part of God's plan? I'm sure many of us would answer with a resounding Amen. Yes. Therefore, here's the point. God has a divine purpose in suffering. Allow me to read to you the prophecy seen in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. And answer this, huh? what was Yahweh's will for His Son? It says here, yet it was the Lord's will to crush Him, to cause Him to suffer. And though the Lord makes His life a guilt offering, 
he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. Now this is so important to bear in mind, people, that suffering has a place in God's plan. The reason I stress this is that there are people today, many people today, who do not believe that suffering is part of God's plan. And they reason, how can a loving God ever will suffering to happen? Especially to His children. And when they do suffer, they resent their situation and they resent God for allowing these things to happen to them. But we see, especially from the death, the suffering of Jesus Christ, that suffering has a place in God's plan. Now, we've seen the plan of God, the plan of God for Jesus to suffer and die. Now we see the purpose of Christ's suffering. Huh? The purpose of Christ's suffering. What's the divine intention of God? It says in our text, in order that he might bring us to God. Through his vicarious death, we may be reconciled back to God. Huh? That's, that's the purpose. That's the beautiful purpose in this gruesome event. Romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. He's not talking about the peace of God, but peace with God. In other words, we were reconciled with God through His death on the cross, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is further reiterated in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. It says there, in bringing many sons to glory. That's reconciliation, bringing us together with God. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now here's another question. Was Christ successful in accomplishing His purpose? Was Christ successful in bringing God and man together into a perfect relationship? Certainly, certainly. And the proof of his victory was his resurrection on the third day. Beloved, believers are now brought into a perfect union with God through Jesus Christ. Let's look at the victory wrought by the suffering of Jesus Christ as found in the second part of our passage. Let's look at the proof of his triumph. It says there, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In other words, what this passage is saying is that his resurrection was God's seal of success. Jesus Christ is now able to save because he rose from the dead proving that he had life in him and he had life to give. His suffering brought about glory. Salvation would never have been accomplished without the suffering of Jesus Christ. Moreover, Jesus Christ, it says here, announced his triumph. Huh? He announced his triumph to the entire spirit world. Let's look at the proclamation of Jesus Christ. It says here, In which also he went and made 
proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now, this is quite a difficult passage to interpret. What's this all about? Jesus Christ proclaiming to the spirits who are in prison, those who were disobedient during the time of Noah? Huh? Uh, well, there are three differing opinions. Uh, three varying interpretations. Let me share them with you. The first one is that Jesus preached to the dead for the very purpose of persuading them so that they would have the opportunity to be saved. Now, I beg to disagree. This is not the meaning of the passage. Uh, why is that? Because it would contradict another passage of Scripture. The book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews says it is appointed for a man to die once. Afterwards comes judgment. There is no second chance. Huh? There is no second chance for the one who has died and who has rejected Jesus Christ. Now, second, some take this to mean that Jesus Christ preached in the Spirit through Noah. This is grammatically possible, but once again, I do not lean towards this interpretation. I take it to mean, and here comes the third interpretation, I take this to mean that Jesus went down to the place of the dead, that is Hades, huh? to proclaim His triumph over sin and death, to proclaim His triumph over the unbelieving world. It was not an evangelistic message that he preached, no. But it was more of an announcement of his victory. Now, a particular emphasis is made on those who were disobedient during the time of Noah. Why the emphasis? Huh? Because Noah is an example of suffering for righteousness sake. When Noah was commanded by God to build an ark, he also proclaimed a, a message of repentance and salvation to the people that, uh, who lived during his day. He suffered when he proclaimed God's message to the disobedient people of his day. You could just imagine the ridicule and the rejection of Noah's preaching. What they were actually rejecting was God's salvation. And Christ, by His announcement, by His announcement of triumph, vindicated Noah by showing to them that there is victory when you trust in God's message of salvation. Beloved, I await another vindication. I await a day when Christ will come and vindicate all those who had suffered for Him. And I see this in Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. It says this, After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are His judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of His servants. I await this time of vindication. I await this time when Jesus Christ will vindicate all those who have believed in Him and those who have suffered for His sake. 
Now, let's look at the product of Christ's suffering. Huh? The Apostle Peter says, And corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. But not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, what does Peter say in this passage? He says here, Jesus Christ saves us through baptism. But he emphasizes, huh? he emphasizes the point that this baptism is not the baptism of water. Some people think that by going through a rite of baptism, then that would save you. Huh? That would save you. No, the Apostle Peter says, not the baptism of water that simply removes dirt from the body, but that of a good conscience brought about by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the flood in Noah's time is a foreshadowing of God's judgment and salvation through Jesus Christ. It prefigures, it prefigures for us what Jesus Christ will be doing through His death. Notice this, the flood that judged the world also saved Noah and his family, right? And in like manner, the death of Jesus Christ is the judgment on, of God on sin. And yet, it is also the means by which God saves us from sin. We are saved by virtue of our union with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We read that in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. This is the baptism that truly saves. He says there, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with Him like this in His death, we will certainly also be united with Him in His resurrection. Let me explain a term here, baptism. Baptism means to immerse or to dip. Uh, that is, according to the original language. Huh? It also means to be identified, totally identified with something. Now, Peter tells us that the baptism that saves is not the one that removes dirt. Now, what's that all about? Huh? He's referring to water baptism or the rite the ritual of water baptism which Jesus Christ commanded. But understand this, Jesus Christ commands us to undergo baptism, not for us to be saved. But the baptism, the, the, uh, the rite of water baptism is for us uh, to express our obedience to Jesus Christ. It is a means to express our allegiance to Him as Lord, whom we would be obeying from the point of our conversion. Now, we can be baptized by water. We can undergo this rite and still not be saved. Huh? Water baptism at most, simply removes dirt from our body. So Peter tells us, this is the baptism that saves. The baptism of being united with Christ's death and resurrection through faith in Him. 
This is the baptism that cleanses our conscience. This is the baptism that removes guilt brought about by our sin. That's the real spiritual baptism. So you can go through a rite, any rite for that matter, and still not be saved if you do not put your faith in Jesus Christ. Finally, finally, we see the preeminence of Jesus Christ brought about by the death and resurrection of Christ. It says here, who is at the right hand of God? Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Finally, Jesus Christ's victory is seen in the preeminent position that was given to him by God, by God the Father. He is seated above all powers, all principalities, you know, all rulers. He is king and he sits in a glorious position. And I love what the Apostle Paul says in the book of Ephesians that we believers of Jesus Christ are also in a spiritual way seated with Him in the heavenly realms in this glorious position. And that will be fully realized when Jesus comes back. Two simple points. Two points as we close. The first one I'd like us to remember is this. Christ suffered for righteousness sake now his suffering brought about our own redemption in other words when we suffer for righteousness sake God has a reason God always has a reason for that and secondly since we are spiritually saved beloved we do not have to fear our physical suffering, right? For our momentary afflictions here on earth brought about by our faith in Jesus Christ cannot be compared to the glory that Jesus Christ has reserved for us in the future. 